Well, 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 would you look at that? B-Link has another machine, but this is the first. Two firsts. One, it's the first Intel Core Ultra 9 185H processor-based mini PCs that I've looked at. Can the Core Ultra go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other offerings that we've seen? We'll find out soon. But also this mini PC supports a full-sized PCI Express graphics card? You could put a 4090 in this? Oh, and we will. We will. So this is the Frost Silver version of <laughs> gaming, rendering, high-speed graphics, display, and more. Now, you don't have to use this with an external GPU. You can buy this for a while and use it as a mini PC. Or not. It just depends on you, what you want to do. Now, it is kind of wildly impractical when you look at it. It's neat. You can 3D print a case for it. You can use a stand for it. But basically, you have a bare naked GPU sitting on your machine that you just slam into a mini PC. Uh, but make no mistake, this thing packs uh, quite a wallop. I mean, it's got 32 gigs of memory and a terabyte of storage in my configuration, but there's some other configurations. You can move up to 96 gigabytes of DDR5. You can have more storage, four terabytes is definitely within the realm of possibility because it is upgradable. It's a very, very Mac-like form factor. Two and a half gig LAN and Wi-Fi 7. At the rear, we have the 110 volt power input. Yes, this has its own built-in power inverter. It doesn't require an external brick. No, it does not. We have our combination headphone microphone jack, a USB type C port, HDMI, and full size display port. We got two LAN ports with USB on top and then two more type A ports off to the side. On the front, we've got another type C, full size SD card slot, another combination headphone microphone jack, power button, which is also a combination fingerprint sensor, as well as another type A. Now the PCIe port on the bottom is really designed to be used with a dock. There's a special dock that B-Link makes that goes with this and so you should uh, use that you should read the user manual carefully before you go off reservation and off script with this now the teardown of this thing is actually really interesting it's got a built-in sound system that actually sounds pretty good and it's got this mesh dust filter so you can pop four screws off the bottom clean your dust filter you also had a clearer view of this expansion slot thing i don't think it's safe to use this with a PCIe riser cable or something creative like that. I think you're gonna need B-Link's actual dock. That hasn't come in yet at the time of this video. So I'll probably have to cover that in a future video or get creative myself, but I really wanna do that and see how that goes. Tearing this thing down to get to its dual 2280 M.2 PCIe Gen 4 slots, as well as its DDR5 memory, you're gonna have to take out like 21 to 26 screws. You gotta take the dust filter off, and then you gotta take the power brick out. Now the power brick, 19 volt output, it's built in. It's not exactly, I mean, it's serviceable, but it'll go from the 110 volt connection here into here. It's 19 volts. Uh, it's about 150 watt power brick is, is what you need to know, but the output of the thing is uh, 19 volts. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just built right in. The airflow for this thing is pretty wild. It's designed to pull air from the bottom and exhaust it at the back. The top is closed. And it is a metal case, so you know it's going to act a little bit like a heat sink. The, the metal sandwiching here for the speakers and everything else is also pretty tight and acts as a heat sink. Now the memory is not in direct contact with anything, but it does look like it's got a little bit of airflow. There are airflow channels that are cut in the metal here so that the, the memory can breathe a little bit. But that is something to keep an eye on. DDR5 can silently throttle when it gets hot. It, in the system is a crucial set of crucial 16 gigabyte BIMs in our configuration, and then we got a Fison controller based P3 Plus M2280 one terabyte. So that's a, again a crucial brand storage device as well. Overall, my impression of the internal engineering, the CMOS battery is accessible as standard 2230, but it does have a little dollop of glue to keep it from popping out. Like if you dropped it really hard, the battery would probably pop out. I probably discovered that in testing. There's a little tiny heatsink on the USB-C connector on the front in the case this thing is doing a wicked amount of USB-C charging. This has got a lot of thoughtful and hard-won engineering knowledge in it. This is not a fly-by-night design. There don't seem to be a lot of shortcuts in the design just from looking at it. I can tell that somebody experienced, I think, put this together or that this is a piece of hardware that has evolved through uh, several designs and several iterations. Clearly, B-Link has their eye on 
making a lot of these and becoming a bigger brand for commercial, hospitality, etc. type uses, or just, you know, secondary PC, guest PC, living room PC, home theater, streaming machine, like this has got those use cases written all over it. All right, let's talk speeds and feeds and compatibility and also performance comparison. Yeah, this is the Ryzen 7 8845HS based mini PC. How does that stack up against Meteor Lake? Well, first off, there's Thunderbolt compatibility. Thunderbolt USB 4, let's talk about that. And good news about the USB 4 support. Thunderbolt, basically, I've got, <laughs> I've got a Radeon 7 external GPU. Okay, the front USB-C port won't work, but the rear run does. Yeah, granted, USB 4 is still pretty anemic. It's only 40 gigabit. Thunderbolt 5 cannot get here fast enough, but Meteor Lake's not enabled for Thunderbolt 5. I mean, Meteor Lake, the power envelope, really, we, we were already pushing it, so. Thunderbolt 4. It'll work fine for, you know, a lower, uh, lower middle of the road GPU for external GPU gaming or an external interface. But still, it's pretty awesome that it's got it in the first place. What about our raw architecture, our raw performance? Well, the first thing that you have to remember when we're talking about Meteor Lake is that this has six performance cores, four efficiency cores, and then two more efficiency cores that are actually on a different part of the CPU. Remember, this CPU is originally meant for laptops. And a laptop in a low, 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 low power state where it just needs to check your email or do a couple of things can wake up those two ultra efficiency cores that are off away from everything else. So it doesn't really have to turn on the main part of the processor. And that is a good strategy for notebooks, Meteor Lake notebooks. But in a desktop machine that's always connected, eh, not really super useful. And keep in mind, this thing running full tilt can use north of 100 watts out of that CPU because you're talking about art graphics, the NPU, and everything else. Nevertheless, this thing is going to find a permanent place on my shelf because it is a great exemplar of the Meteor Lake architecture, including its NPU. One key competitive differentiator against the 8845HS as it is in here could be the NPU if there was a killer application for the NPU because Intel and AMD have gone different directions in terms of how they're implementing AI on their products. NPUs really make sense on devices that are powered from a battery because an NPU is designed to be able to offer GPU-like compute at ultra low power specifically customized to the type of GPU compute a large language model or other AI type processing would be doing. Nevertheless, the functionality is fully there and it is fully in Windows, but Microsoft being fully focused on Copilot on ARM hasn't really done much to enable the ecosystem for NPUs on Windows. So it's there, but right now there's no killer application. All right, first up our Geekbench scores, 2235 and 11425. This is pretty respectable performance. Keep in mind, we have 16 cores to work with and 22 threads. So on the one hand, the single core score could be a little higher. It can't quite outclass its Ryzen counterpart that's competitive. And then the multi-core score also comes in a little behind, which is surprising. I think the answer might be in our A to 64 benchmark. Our A to 64 benchmark shows kind of an eye-watering 170 nanoseconds of latency. I mean, this is DDR5-5600. DDR5-5600 latency shouldn't be this high, really. So even for eSports titles and very light gaming, because those gaming workloads share the access to the DRAM subsystem in this, I don't know that the experience is going to be all that good. And that's probably why this thing comes in a little behind with its multi-core score. Nevertheless, with all of that, this makes it pretty reasonable and competent workstation, information station type work machine. It's got a micro SD slot and some other nice quality of life features. BIOS being fully unlocked is also a nice feature. So it's reasonable performance for what it is. It's a nice recycling of mobile PCs into a desktop form factor that most of the time runs pretty cool until you're asking it to do Geekbench for hours on end. And then nah, it's, it's pushing it a little bit. So all in all, that's pretty much it for our GTI from B-Link. It's a competent little machine. It's definitely not earth shattering. It's not gonna break any world records or anything like that, but it does have a very unique feature in the PCIe expansion option. The PCIe expansion option could up unlock a whole new world of possibilities where whatever you're doing will work with six performance cores. I worry about the memory latency. That may be something that's worth spending some time in the BIOS tuning. Again, this is the out of the box default. Maybe it's possible to improve the memory timing or go in and, and fiddle with it. JetX standard 5600, not really that slow, but those E cores that are on the external complex 
may need to be disabled. But for gaming workloads, and especially if we add an external GPU to this, that's gonna be one of the things that I test in that video is, can we claw back some of the memory latency? Can we disable some of the e-cores and get back some of the memory latency and gaming performance? What does gaming performance look like when we fiddle with some of those settings in the BIOS, which is very nice that it's not unlocked. Dual LAN could make some interesting applications using this for Linux or anything else because it is a mix of performance cores and efficiency cores. You know, if your temptation is to run Proxmox or some sort of virtualization distro like that on this platform, Meteor Lake, there's a lot that is better if it's a homogenous architecture, if you get my drift. If you're mixing big cores and little cores and virtualization and that kind of a workload, even for like a home lab, eh. But for me, having access to the NPU and the Meteor Lake platform and having that for testing, this is gonna stick around here at level one for a little while. I'm one of this level one. This has been a look at the GTI from B-Link. Most exciting feature, definitely the PCIe expansion, but it's a competent little Meteor Lake machine. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums if you wanna see me test it or do anything that I missed or run a particular workload or whatever. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.